<laughs> but um, uh, look, I think first I would just speak to what I know and what I celebrate Eid and how I do and why I have been taught we celebrate this. Um, because I cannot speak to other cultures and the way they have raised. So whatever, whoever answered you would experience what his experience is about that, you know? Sure, sure, sure. sure. So, you know what I mean? Uh, but we have two Eids. We have the Eid that comes after Ramadan. And that is uh, Eid, the small Eid, we call it, which is the Eid al-Fitr. And, um, and it comes after Ramadan. It's three days after Ramadan, just to celebrate the month of the Holy Ramadan and the fasting mm -hmm. for a month and so on. Mm -hmm. And then comes the second Eid uh, that comes after 10 days of Hajj, as you said, the pilgrimage and going to Mecca and all the kind of traditions and uh, um, like, um, I don't know what's the word, but what we do for, for like for Hajj or only some people that go to Hajj, but also we have 10 of the most, um, 10 of the most, uh, holy days in the year that people like do lots of things um, like more practice and so on around that time uh, and the, in the end of it um, there's a story about uh, God asking his prophet Ibrahim to slaughter a lamb so slaughter his son and then he sent um, uh, an angel to correct that and say to him that um, no I, it was a test kind of some, of some sort and like ask the um, angel to tell him to slaughter the lamb as a sacrifice on the, the day of Eid, mm. the morning of Eid. So okay. it's kind of uh, like in a short I, kind of thing. I knew this already. I'm, I'm glad because, because when they gave me this explanation about returning from the Hajj, I was like, you know, that doesn't ring with me. Um, but uh, okay. Um, but, uh, but I remember, yeah, yeah, about, about the sacrifice. Sure. Yeah. So that's yeah, kind thanks of for clarifying. What, like it's too Eid and it's not, really, they're not really related. It's just, the time is normally two months and 10 days after the first Eid. That's kind of, and there's not related, like the, the Ramadan one and the other Eid is not really related. Not, well. So what does this word Eid mean? Eid is a it's, festival. It just means festival, generally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's so, okay. like celebration festival. Okay, okay. The one at the end of Ramadan, I believe the Malays call it Hari Raya. Mm -hmm. And then and then we couldn't we couldn't decide what they call this Eid that we just celebrated yeah. recently. I don't know, so because there's... I didn't know, I didn't live there. We, we call them both Eid, Eid al-Futr and Eid al-Adha, the second one. But I, as I said, like, I think it's a say, it would be the same, there's different tradition in, in Iran, isn't it, Said? Like, it's like, it's different in each place because sometimes as well, ages ago, people couldn't, like people from Malaysia would have to take the, the uh, water, like to travel by water to get to um, to Mecca and think about it before there wasn't really much of an easy way to get to Mecca easy like this so I would believe as well that they haven't really celebrated Eid because it the month the Eid the, the they would have left even during Ramadan sometimes to get there because of the travel uh, my parents when my parents went to Hajj they went for 40 days but now they do it even with less than 10 days because of the trouble. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a big difference the way you think about it. And I believe, again, because of their tradition and the way they used to do it and the way they have to travel between Malaysia and the Arab, the, the, to and Mecca, it was a long time to get. So they, their journey would yeah. be much longer. Now, now the ones who were explaining to us were the, some very close friends from Kashmir and then um, the, the rest of us were, were not Muslims. Um, at that at that gathering, there were there were a couple of guys from Bangladeshi, but their English was too bad to be able to communicate to, to participate in the conversations. Yeah, the ca the Kashmiris have their own traditions and explanations as well, as, as you yeah. said. But as you say, like think about it, even people from like further places and so on. I think that makes sense. What do you think, Saeed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, uh, what you said, the story is the story that I've heard as well. And it is in Quran as well, I guess. So um, yeah, that's the origin of the day. It's all about sacrifice. Yeah. And yeah, very similar. Is it, is it a traditional family day? Is, is this a day when you it gather is. with your families or is it a day yeah, for prayers at the mosque? So it's a family time. It's, it's both, both. We, we go into the mosque. So in the, it depends, of course, like, you know, for how religious people are. I used to go with my family to the mosque. Actually, that was um, one of the favorite times that I had of Eid. And this Eid, I created an online takbirat. So I, I just called the Eid 
with people uh, with children and like normally we go to the mosque and we keep saying like for hours Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Walillahi Alhamd Allahu Akbar Kabira Walhamdulillahi Kathira Wa Subhanak Allahumma Wa Bihamdika Bukratahu Wa Asila La Ilaha Illa Allah and we go for hours like just repeating wow. that so, um, Beautiful. yeah, and I miss it. Yeah, it I is the, it here. It's just a waste. It's a big celebration day, uh, um, Nathan. It's I've been seeing photos of family. It's a day vegetarians wouldn't want to be in Iran or any Muslim countries these days. <laughs> day starts with killing a. Um, basically a sacrifice, a, a sheep, we had the photos. And all well, for those who afford it, you know, what's not many her, What's her name? <laughs> uh, so yeah. early in the morning, five o'clock with the morning um, uh, Prayer. prayers, they basically kill it. And then it's a tradition, they um, giving it away probably half of it to neighborhood and all the rest. And then big festivals in uh, elderly of the family. My parents had all my brothers and sisters and all their families in. So it's a big day. And then obviously the, the prayer in the mosques in the neighborhoods also, it's a big uh, tradition goes with it too. I will tell you another uh, thing interesting, Nathan. When you, we, like when the family slaughter a lamb, they used to call me because normally they put all like the lamb that they slaughter in three pieces, three vials. And my auntie will ask me to look in the other side. And like, so they will have one, two, three vials of the meat and they will mix it. But you know, there's big, bitter meat and less good meat in the lamb, you know? So what she will say, because she doesn't want to choose what she will keep to her, what she will give family, and what she will divide for um, poorer people. Poor people. So she will say, this, 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 who, to, who for? And I cannot see, but she will just change. And I say, uh, this, this, and well, this, 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 who for? And like, I will just say this one. And like, that's where kind of like, it's the purest way to divide something without really taking the best for yourself, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I love that. I just really remember how holy and amazing those times. And I really miss it. That's one of the things I really miss in, in this country as well. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Let's start. <laughs> I mean, we kind of already started, but I'll just officially start and say a massive welcome to Asil, who is an inspiration to me. I find um, her energy and her force for creating light and nur in this world, something that um, I know has created a massive difference for many already. And um, her story is a really inspiring one. And I feel really honored to have her tonight present at Home Uni. So a big welcome to Asil and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And I'm so excited to see faces. Of course, I don't know and I haven't heard about, um, but it's so, uh, so heartwarming to be here and just to talk about things uh, that I really miss and I like um, and to share kind of um, things with you. I Like I spoke to Rachel before, I would like to share with you some things, who I am, what did I do, what brought me to Australia kind of some personal uh, and some other things that I would like to share with you about my art and why I made it uh, and um, and about my activism and my life but also to leave a space for you and thank you Nathan for making this also like kind of a, I will come into space as well to kind of start asking questions because I love when people ask and not keep it and I'm here I have no time limit but um, I was not sure what I would say in an hour and that's kind of for you to ask as well later on if there's anything you guys would like to uh, hear and know more about. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. So I will share with you um, my account uh, and I won't be able to see your faces. So if you want to talk, please just like, you know, either write in the chat or like ask Rachel and she can like message Rachel and I can stop because I prefer you ask the questions 
or like write them in the chat immediately and we can go back to them if that's much easier so you don't forget it. Is that okay? Rachel, is that all good? Great. Okay, so before I um, start, I want to just tell you a little bit like uh, as um, and they can see me, right, Rachel? They can see my face? Yes, you can see. Me. Okay, now I can see you. I found out the way. <laughs> so that's great. So um, uh, before I start, I just, I was born in Jerusalem. I want to tell you a little bit about that. I was born in the most beautiful cities. Uh, unfortunately, a place that I haven't really seen peace much. Um, and uh, I was born next to Al-Aqsa. So it's a place I used to go and pray. And that's where, where my parents um, decided to study. So that's where I was born. And I was raised in there until I was uh, going to high school or like I would, we would say it's like secondary school back home because we have three kind of parts, not like Australia. Uh, and I then um, uh, went back again to study in Jerusalem. I studied pharmacy for three and a half years. Uh, and then I studied arts. I couldn't continue as a pharmacist. I didn't find myself there. And you will find out more why later. Uh, and I uh, then studied arts for my bachelor and my master's. And I um, started working on projects back in Palestine. Uh, I, I was thinking to share with you some of the projects I have done in there, just kind of out of what we did and what we, why I did it. Uh, so growing in Palestine, it's a very conservative place. As a person with a hijab, as a performer, that you heard a little bit about, like, like not singing, but I call for prayer, but as a performer, wearing hijab, it wasn't really easy. And even for ladies and girls that are not really hijabis and not very um, uh, religious, it was very hard, very hard to be to express themselves. And I think that talks about lots of um, our countries, maybe the Arab and the Muslim countries. And I think you will agree with me, Saeed, about what I'm talking, or thinking about, how kind of some traditions can stop us from being who we are. Uh, and I have the most beautiful parents, but also they were religious and they, my dad will not talk to me if I, thing for a month like he doesn't he doesn't want it because he's very religious he loves me for other reasons but not this one and it was very hard if my parents were so open-minded and so on open-minded to the traditions that i'd grown up it was so hard for other children so when i started uh, my art uh, degree and education i started a project called fingerprint and i worked with the girls on so many identity issues art issues self-expression projects that we have done um, in so many places around in Palestine, in from the north to the south, going to different villages and kind of doing some, uh, what they normally call it boy work of like painting and so on and just doing this ourselves, re re um, creating spaces and like making more art projects and so on. And one of the things we did as well is going to hospitals every time there was Eid, for example, like another project I did here, and um, I didn't have a space. I really couldn't have a space. And if you see the girls, they are all high school girls, but they're sitting on in a kindergarten because that's uh, the only uh, place my auntie owned, and I could have the girls. No one could support us before doing this, and there's no opportunities for us to do that. No, it's not something that, you know, having a leadership program for girls in high school wasn't something that people will do or support or even care about. Moms and dads will not really support the girls to come to this. Why are you following this girl? They don't really believe in it. So that's one kind of, now most of them are really leaders in their community. They send me messages all the time. This is because of this. We have we couldn't do this without this project. We you gave us the place we want to be. It was very safe for us to actually be present and share our opinions, and that's because that's made me who I am today. So they are now like I would say seven years older than this, or like eight years older than this. And I see them, and I'm so proud of them. And they are all finished uni, school, uni and doing their own thing. Um, and the other project I did was called um, ML. I don't have photos of it but was also a place where I gathered young children in Palestine in year five and six. And every week for five hours, we would gather, make art, poetry, 
reading. Like it was a beautiful project, which Amal called is, is hope. And they will gather and make things together and they will have a competition of reading and they will complete how many hundreds of stories they will read. People really supported it. But it was very hard because again, when you start something from scratch, from nowhere that no one have ever done theater for children and that's done for children and by children and with children, all the kind of the audience and the performers. And then to teach singing when you are not allowed to sing as a female, all of it was like a struggle, but made me who I am and made me who I want to be. Um, but that's kind of like the um, more of a community project that I always love. Um, but I will share with you one other thing I did and I also love so much called You Are Not A Boy, a project that was my, uh, uh, not this one, let me just see, I think it was the exhibition, just one moment. Um, so I have watched, I have watched, uh, I will show you about this one and then other ones, but I have watched a video that is working on uh, what the taboo is and that's kind of like showing to men holding a little girl into a room and for females we will look oh, what this man is gonna do with this like what, where are they taking it head and then they leave her in a room with her mom that uses and because there's children I won't say much but they use the hot chili to burn the girl and just to keep her virgin and that was kind of like a very hard thing done by women for other women and just because she's not a boy you know and that was very kind of that stayed in my head for a long time and one day I was I was um, um, I was a um, protester in Palestine against occupation and against all that's happening for Palestinians and um, I was putting my kofia which I was I don't know if I don't have any here, but I will show you another photo of Akfiya. And my and my grandma said to me, stop it, you are not a boy. Stop doing all the boy things. You cannot just keep going and fighting. You cannot just keep protesting. And like that kind of like um, a coin that dropped in my head. And like, that's it. I'm just because it's all because I'm not a boy. I'm not allowed to be who I am. I'm not allowed to be doing what's what I'm supposed to do. And I created this work in Palestine. Um, and I then I recreated it here in Australia. But basically, I um, I created this uh, where is it? dress. It's a, dr a whole dress that I took a video and filmed dizziness, like like circles, 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 until I fall on the floor. And I projected it in under this under this uh, big dress. It's like a few meters dress, white one, and the projection was inside. And there's a um, bladder inside written in it, which is taboo in Arabic. So it's a bladder that they normally also use for the same reasons. I just created it out of wood and I projected all this dizziness on it. And that's what you can see in this video. Uh, I cannot see more photos of the dress, unfortunately. Uh, but um, you can imagine kind of the dress inside, there's a hole in between where the video is projecting. And I stand, I did a performance as well, singing lullabies that are sang only for girls and kind of telling stories of different things that happened to me in my life and kind of, of like men forcing their power and men stopping us doing who we are and being who we are. Um, and I took one by one of the aib, each pieces of this uh, fabrics called written on it taboo which is Zaib and I took it out of my dress and put it on other men that I've seen in there saying Aib like it's it's for, it's the, it's a taboo uh, it's forbidden um, so that's when I whenever I talk about this I feel like my hands shaking because it's it brings a lot of of memories and and things that I uh, have been through as well the other project very related to this uh, it's called Men in Demand, and um, I will tell. I won't tell you the full story because it's a hard one. Uh, but I worked um, on this project. I was engaged twice before I married my husband, and after the second breaking of engagement, I uh, I had one of the students, one of the those groups of the students that I showed you before, saying to me, "My mom said, oh, I see it." Does it mean it? Does it? Uh, is that right that I won't get married? And I said, 
what do you mean? Like, who said so? She said, my mom, I want to be like you. And my mom said that you are very strong and you will never get married. <laughs> so that was like, mm, that's very interesting to hear. And I was like, I just wanted to know what, why would a child that is year nine tell me that? So like very funny way or very seriously, I sent emails, phone messages. There was no WhatsApp then, but phone messages, emails, um, Facebook messages to every single man I have ever met. And I said to him, why didn't you marry me? I just wanted to know, I was so curious to know. Even those that in, introduced me and wanted to be engaged with me, why didn't you even insist, you know? I just was really curious to know, how right is this woman saying about me? Would I need actually be married again or not? And believe it or not, my dad said, I won't let you marry your husband if I knew one man in Palestine will marry you. So um, that's kind of a little bit about that. But um, uh, I sent those messages and I worked with a, um, a dress designer that was very kind of anti-woman, I would say, anti-women freedom. And I went to him specifically because he designed my first two dresses. I don't know why him, I didn't know that about him. Trust me, if I knew I wouldn't go, but I just knew that after a conversation. Uh, and I said to him, you would work for free on this project for me to create a dress that no pride want to wear. And I will keep sending you the questions and answers that I send those men. And whenever there's a new answer, you will add it in a design way you have to find a way to add it to the dress. I will show you the dress. I hope I have a photo of that one. Uh, where is it? Oh God, not even that way I would find it for you. Uh, but working with that person and I hope, this would not go to my mom, right? Just because I want to make sure. <laughs> but working on that, uh, on this project with this person was so hard. I have heard lots of abusing words and lots of bad, ex I have had lots of bad experiences. One of the times I went there, he tried to attack me and it was very hard. I, that's something that I couldn't share back home, but I'm sharing to you just to explain why it's important to share this work with the world. Uh, and, and then I was in a place, would I go back again with him and, and work with him on this or not? And because my um, uh, graduation was a week after, and because of a weakness that lots of us women face, while working, while living together in the same house with other men that is the abuser, because of one million reasons that we men, we women suffer, I went back again and got that dress and created this artwork. But instead of doing it the way I wanted, I just got lots of pieces of fabric, around 77 of them, which is the 77 answers the men I sent, hundreds of them just answered. And I wrote all the answers on this, um, fabric pieces and for hours I would like on the presentation day for hours I would just like sing and take it out and I would just say Rahu which is gone and it goes like Rahu, 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 Rahu. so like that will go more and more all the time to kind of um for for like seven hours of the exhibition every day i would just stay, stay there no water no food just singing it and like crushing more of the embroidery that has been done um, and that's just a statement like i love when people do art and just painting to put in houses but for me i studied arts because as a palestinian i wanted to change i want every single thing that um got me into jail because i protested to be able to save me from being there, but still doing my work the way I want and give, get the message out without being in troubles as I used to be. I am still in troubles. Whenever I'm in Palestine, I am, I have to admit, but that's a kind of a different trouble that I try to save myself from. And hopefully like one day, I don't need really need to fight for these things because that will be the reality of us and like the reality of like we would have our rights and our freedom to be who we are and who we actually want to be other than uh, what people enforce us to be and where they send us um, to those kind of squares they want us to live in. Uh, but that's kind of about Palestine's work. And then I met my husband. 
well, I got married. He loved exactly what people hated. Just me being strong and being who I am and being standing for who I want to be. Mm -hmm. We met really surprisingly um, because of another friend that um, that um, worked in Jazeera, which is one of the news, and we just got to know each other. But it was amazing meeting him because of photography, and we become couples. And I made moved here to Australia. Uh, and like I would say, lots of us on this chat, we know um, how hard it is to just move from a place to a new place that don't speak your language. I actually remember when my husband, and I thought I had an okay English, my husband took me to the bank the next day I arrived and the woman was talking. She thinks she spoke in English, but I looked at her like this and said, can you speak in English please? Because that's not really the accent I am used to as well. And that was really strange. Um, and it was very hard because I was the only one wearing my hijab in the place I moved to. I moved to Bunbury. I don't know how many of you were in Bunbury. Um, it's an amazing, like, hot, um, I don't know what's the word, warming with a and beautiful space, but that's all about it for me. <laughs> and it was so, so hard to land in such a place. I can see you, Eloise, laughing and you, I can imagine why. Um, so it was really hard, um, but you I know, know Bunbury very well. <laughs> yeah, I'm in it's Melbourne a... for the same reason, and I didn't move from Palestine. <laughs> so yes, uh, yes. So uh, that's why I uh, moved from like graduating. This um, um, graduation project I just mentioned to you made me one of the finalist uh, three artists all, all in the whole country. It was very strong and very powerful to share uh, and then I moved to Bunbury which is I couldn't have anything I knocked I sent emails I, I remember more than a thousand emails to people uh, in there asking them uh, to work to volunteer and whenever they invite me to go there they would just uh, um, apologize and say oh sorry they see me with a hijab or a person of color whatever the reason is and they will not give me anything uh, and I, I was there with two three degrees even more than anyone there I have I don't, I know that have studied, but I'm not from there. Um, but every time people ask me, where are you from? And they will mean, is it from East Bunbury or Withers or North Bunbury or the city? I would say I'm from Palestine. I know that that's not one more thing that made them so upset. As East Bunbury is a city, you know, is a, is a country, whatever. So that's how, how loved. But one beautiful thing happened in Bunbury that I am so proud of is me volunteering in the multicultural space in there, the center. And in one of the um, one of the times that I was volunteering, there was a three-year-old just standing. I would show you just so you understand. I was working, and she was like like this, looking at me like that for like like a few minutes or like ten minutes. And then I looked at her, was like, "Sweetie, are you okay?" And she said, "Do you have hair like that?" And I loved it. I loved it. I just wanted like to hold her. And I said, okay, yes, I do. Do you want me to show you? So I took her all the way to the end of the, like, of the um, walk, like walking kind of, I don't know what we call the door, but like, it's like, you know, corridor and where the toilets are, because I cannot just take my hijab off in front of everybody coming in. And before I like, I just took the hijab like that and I did like this with my hair and I couldn't see her. And she's like, mom, she has hair. And like, that was one of the most beautiful times that I ever worked with a child and like one of the most beautiful stories. But that made me feel that there's lots of children out there that are so curious and so would love to know more of, you know, what they are and who is this person in front of them. They have so innocent questions and they want and so curious about them. So I took some of my hijabs the ones I put under and mirrors and went to schools just to share with children what does it mean you know putting the hijab how do you even do it why do we wear it what's the story behind it just like Aid Nathan I just wanted them to know and not stay with assumptions and you know not really clear answers to their curiosity and since then Louise, I had friends everywhere, not the parents, who cares, the children, like I would see people like waving for me because I went to so many schools around the area and they would be waving and like pointing at me. I just became the star without really feeling because everybody loved 
like oh she's the women i didn't care who what they will call me they were just smiling whenever they see me and that made me feel for one moment really welcome in a place like that but luckily enough i moved to melbourne i went we came to melbourne uh to um uh, like to for a holiday just a few months after I said like why don't you live here like what why did you take me to Bambi my husband was here uh, before me a year and a half before me and like what's wrong with Melbourne what ended up in you know whatever, uh, but we ended up here and I met a lady called Samah Sabawi which is a playwright and she invited me I met her um i sent her so many emails and she didn't reply and then someone linked us say please she here she's here she wants to see some arabs some activists she's like dying in bumbry help this little poor woman so we met and then just before we left them her and her husband they were so amazing and just before we left them i sang to them one of because her husband kept talking about one of the singers and i didn't tell them i'm a singer and then i sang for him one of those songs and they both looked at us like that in the car and said like now you're singing that you're going to the movie like where have you been in the whole um uh, night so um a few a few months later i was traveling with my husband and the family in europe and she sent me an email hey i am i have written this play and i would love you to come and play it and the play is about one of the most beautiful and close city to my heart gaza and and i just couldn't say no. I, I came here and stayed in her house and lived there for like a few months until the play was done. Worked in the musical direction and like I sang in this play. It was a beautiful play about two a actor, two a characters. One Palestinian that has grown all his life in America and he's a doctor and a journalist um, that's grown up in Gaza and he gets to Gaza on the boats, the um, freedom boats that came to Gaza on like 2008 or something and um and he's just like it's a love story that he wants to be there but he can't because he's not used to the like the siege on gaza and that's beautiful idea behind it it's a stunning play it was like sold out three years in a row and sold out in all the cities we have been through uh, and now it was in canada and in malaysia i wish i knew you nathan i could just send you watch it as well uh, so, um, and that's kind of um, one of the latest projects I have done before I decided to work on Bukje. And Bukje means the sack of belongings that people take with them when they have to leave home. I don't know, what is it in your language, Saeed? Is it, do you know the Bukje word? I cannot hear you. Yeah, same thing, Bukje, with Bukje. some probably different pronunciation but same thing yeah i'm sure it's not really a arabic word it's kind of like uh, like we don't we don't have it really in our word in, in uh, as something we normally use but it's something that i grown up seeing um from mm. the palestinian um uh, nakba photos from the 1948 of all my people carrying their book and yeah and going and not leaving. much used these days now yeah no like not many use it because there's bags and so on but you know 75 seven years ago there was no much options for them to to, to carry their things um yeah. and that's how yeah. i called my project i will show you the logo uh, so you see do i have any okay i will maybe start that i don't think you can hear it but i would really love if you like watch it later that's the um, that's the logo of bookche can you see it so there's the b the the sack the the u the j is the journey and the hate is the home and which is the scent but but in so many ways it can be the home we have left and the home we have chosen or mm. someone chose for us uh, and as a child i've grown up thinking um, what did my people have and carried in their own sacks that is so magical that kept them surviving these days and those hardships for years? It has to be magical that help the mum when her child is is um, is sick and help the grandma when her her husband is so homesick. 
it must be so magical that the dad could be relieved going into, I just imagine the Abukja in the corner of the each tent in the refugee camps and that everybody will go to and find their own thing that they are looking for as it's a magical thing that reveals like, you know, this hat that of the magician that brings all this kind of thing, but it must be not really ending. And when I grew up, I just decided that I want to hear more of those stories. I want to hear more. Um, people think when they see us in the streets and I don't want to blame them for so many reasons. It's an ignorant behavior, but that we have had nothing before we came here and we have no life or no history or no um, anything, no identity of any sort. And and even when we speak four languages, they expect us to, to speak the English one as the best one and they don't speak anything but English. So, and not really good. So we sometimes better speak than them, but let's not talk about that. And, and it was so hard because like we come from warm neighborhoods. We come with a place that filled with the datar and the bread and the warmth of the neighborhoods. And it's just kind of, of, of this takbirat for Eid, like we come with culture and richness. And if anything, if there's warmth anywhere in the place, it's what we have brought for God's sake. And still we are treated as it's not, and nothing is there and, and as numbers and as no identity or history. And that was something that really annoyed me. And what annoyed me more, to be honest, is when people get annoyed of being asked where are they from because I actually wanted to tell the word I'm Palestinian and I wanted to keep I hate that I have some Melbourneian accent because I just want to keep my Arabic hello how are you and I love it so I just something in there that like wanted to highlight those stories in so many ways <laughs> I love that you're laughing guys um and something that's really missing in missing those stories missing what people have brought in their book chairs into australia what their homes looked like but to not be you know to not threaten those that didn't like when people asked them where are they from i went to children i wanted their questions to be innocent and simple and so so beautiful so i went to children at schools and said what would you like to know about your neighbor and the question where, of course, not like the guy in the in the street, was so beautiful. Where like, did it snow in your country? How did you make the bread? Was it circle or was it one of like amazing questions? So innocent. Is it like, did you make shapes in your beer? Like amazing kind of funny questions that will just bring a funny story from people that will tell their story other than the heart, everybody and all the media always look for the other oh, sad story that would make everybody cry and look at these poor refugees what i wanted is actually the rich amazing story that no one talk about because they're so busy explaining to people oh, how crazy was our life and i wanted next to ask people how they are how really they are not just like all the australian culture of like hey hello how are you and let me tell you a story about that in bunbury when i first landed <laughs> I, um, my mom called me, I'm her oldest, so, and for 27 years I lived with my parents. So imagine my mom that have raised and dedicated her life to these five children, have lived her all in one month. One to Australia, which is her oldest, two to Germany, which is the second two, and two, other two, one to Jerusalem and one to Haifa, which is two hours away from where she lives. And we didn't really give my mom a warning, leaving here all of us in that month or two months altogether. So she called me after a few weeks being in Bunbury and said, hey, Asil, if I buy you a house in your beloved Haifa, would you come back? And this silly Asil was in Bunbury that everybody says, hello, and how are you? And I said, mom, are you kidding me? Like, everybody is so nice. I love this place. They're so lovely. If you want to ask me about how I am, and a few days, just a few days after that, I was walking the street so homesick, crying, just missing my mom's touch, her coffee, her tea, her bread, anything about her. 
And someone asked me, hey, hello, how are you? Not really asked me, walked past me, just so I cleared it. Walked past me and said, hey, hello, how are you? And I said, I'm feeling terrible. Thank you for asking. But I looked behind me and the person was not even there to listen to what my story was or what I was feeling. I realized that it's just a tradition that people say it and they never mean it. They just say, hey, hello, and how are you? And keep walking. Not even one person will walk, stand and listen to how I do feel. So I decided to listen. And this is where I started BookJ. I wanted to hear about those I see and I feel so familiar with their face as if they were my brothers and my sisters. I feel the warmth in their eyes when I say, hey, hello, and how are you? And they say, I'm all right but they don't ever expect me to stand and say, tell me about it. So I started to ask and I wanted people to tell me really, really about it. So book two was that, was me taking those stories and going to those communities and say, tell me how are you? And tell me, what do you feel now? Especially in this lockdown, especially in this forever, we wanted to hear stories and retell them in the language that is touching more than any language on earth, which is art. When I sing, it doesn't really matter if you understand what I'm trying to say. You will just feel it deeply inside you. And that's why I brought people, a very religious Egyptian woman and a very not, not even a believer Chilean dancer together into one room to work with the children. I wanted them to learn about themselves and about each other through working with a totally different person that see, look nothing and hear nothing and speak nothing like themselves. And that's the beauty of Bukche, where we bring all these people together in a place that teach intercultural experiences and have it all together. I will show you some without even um, uh, the, the sound, but I will show you, show you a little bit of um, the video just to see like how we, we do it. So the concept is, come on, start please for me. Oh. The concept is having a refugee tent, a re refugee relief tent, like the ones I used to see in back home and bring people inside it. They all sit like this, as if they were in a boat. And they stand there for an hour, an hour and a half, so crowded watching a um, um, theater show that is done with them originally. So we work with the children in the schools and we come back again and present the work for them. And they come and sit inside this tent so tight. We work always with face nation artists that come and as this place in their own country and other artists as well, that tell the story of refugees, tell the story of displacement in their own way, just taking all the interviews and all the documentation we have done and making it into an art piece to tell the story again and teach those children about those art experiences and what does that mean to them. So, um, I don't know if you can, can you see the video? Yes? So I will show you a little bit about how the, um, the tent inside, if, like, if I can see the, um, yeah, so like we sit with the people, we sit with the children, we talk and present the work. Normally theater is like, you stand, finish, clap, go home. But we actually do the opposite. We invite people to sit around us, with us. We finish the show with questions other than, and answers that the children have. We don't leave anyone. We can stay there for like three, four hours after the show is finished, answering people, bridging, bringing bridges, um, building bridges between people that have experienced this and people that are always scared to ask because they don't really know what the person in front of them will answer and what their experience will be and they don't want to offend anyone but they sometimes really want to know, genuinely want to know to help but they don't know the best way. So we were a place, this tent was a place where we bring it together and you can see, maybe you can see the sitting area and how the children are sitting and and we also work, this performance was done with the Samoan group that also where they are from is kind of disappearing for not for war, but for a different reason. And they were just sharing that as well in so many ways and like beautiful song and, um, and dance that they have done. Um, and like, the, sorry, I just like, I love these so much and I would just be distracted watching it while I'm talking to you, so I would stop it. But I would love if you want to go and watch it, the artists talk about it, the, the students have a question and I will show you maybe in the end if there is um, a Q&A 
we do we always do a Q&A and the children share their own um, experiences so you can hear some of theirs in there but Bukja has really brought a lot of uh, joy to my life just learning all these things about those people and just um, meeting a new person every time uh, I, I like so one of the things we worked as well on was this Eid talking about the Eid Nathan and how much I really missed it this Eid I felt that you know we are not um, celebrating Eid here what should I do and how would children really feel that it's Eid so what I did is I called I did a call for donations for art materials and I created 1,500, 1,500 gifts for the children in the flat in North Melbourne and um, I will show you some photos in North Melbourne and Kingston and Carlton. So um, in my, my house, I will show you my house and yes, my husband still didn't divorce me, but he was about to. Uh, this, that was my house. like things everywhere that's my daughter putting all the bonbons and all the giggly eyes and the art materials we had but that's how it looked and we had like uh, like a, a factory line with all these kind of materials because my ha my house is small we put it all small bags but I will show you like at the mosque that how it was yes so you can see maybe maybe here you can see like the factory line so we hold each bag and put one of each in this um, bags for the children and I didn't really know who will really support it it was just an idea that like one day I opened the door and there was a box from a friend in Adelaide with like a thousand dollars of art materials just in front of it, a huge one that is heavy and written heavy in a good way and then more and more people were raising we're sending money we're doing it some people donated sweets that we can put in the packs some donated chocolates some art materials bunning have donated lots I'm not doing um, uh, free advertising, but they have really donated lots of things, thousands of dollars of art materials. Um, and I really loved it. I really, really loved that. But while I was working on it, I felt that, what about Gaza? Like, come on, like, I want to do something for people back home because I always do. And, and there was like a girl that commented on the aid, the gifts I was creating for the flats and said, hey, Asil, can I, um, uh, like ask what you are actually doing and said like let's do something for Gaza and I will tell you a magical story I said look I, I contacted a group that does like birthday parties and I said how much would it cost if you go to 12 neighborhoods of Gaza three days four neighborhood a day to fill the place with love gifts and so on how much that will cost they said 2,000 so I said to my husband look how about we send the money and ask friends to support us to cover some of what we have sent because i still had some money from the flat i was raising and said people will donate i had really trust in that that the money i took from the flat money will go directly to gaza and come back to me my husband was about to put my daughter to sleep like a week ago and i posted that post i said that's what we are doing for gaza we need this much that bath altogether took less than 20 minutes and the whole 2000 was raised within less than 20 minutes he came out of the shower looked at me and i'm very i like i have no idea how i'm keeping my my i don't know if you can see but i'm really keeping my oh, tight not to cry and he came back and he saw me crying i said to him you would not believe that twin like the two thousand dollars you sent has been raised within less than 20 minutes and we have people donated more that we bought some eid gifts for the children but uh, sorry, that eat clothes for the children. Like there was 20. Um, so another thing is there was more money to cover 10 children to buy clothes for Eid. And I was transferring the money that people donated. And there was another call just before I clicked the confirm, say another 2000. And I said to the woman, I'm sending cover another 10 because where there's more money coming within like a minute. So like I know it might be a small amount of money, but to have that within that short time and to have these people's trust because we really do things was huge for me personally, as an individual, not even an organization. And the last thing I want to show you that I have done in, in Palestine is um, I, when I gave my birth to my daughter, I was here by myself away from my family 
and I had a postnatal depression that made me be in the house for like two years. Uh, even when you saw me, Rachel, I was still also in deeply in there, but I don't really show that. I just do things. And because people see me doing things, they don't believe I was in like, postnatal, but I was in so much hard time. But going to the toy library in, in Australia made me think, why don't we ever have something like this? So last year, just like now, I shared the fundraising as well, say to people, I have suffered from this. I want people to, in Palestine to not have that. I want to create a safe place for moms to go. And I posted that online and I woke up in the morning and there was $3,000 donated. Within a month, there was $30,000 donated between shekels in Palestine and dollars in here. And the video I'm going to show you is the first six toy libraries in Palestine, in Gaza, that we have done a year ago. And um, it's a very, very short video, but you can see. I went to Palestine and in there, there was um, other things happening. I will show you also a video from there. My poor mom um, have a house and she's like, can you ever come to Palestine without another project you are doing? But I just don't know how to. So all those toys that you see have been donated by people in Palestine. We literally filled a whole trailer full with toys. There was 280 boxes, 20 pallets full with toys for children in Palestine. And no one was paid to do it, not me, not the people that donated the toys, not people that gathered it, not people that delivered it, no one. And when we went to deliver the toys, in that checkpoint, they returned it because of lots of issues. And the people that donated that money to the delivery um, lost it. So I called an uncle and I said, you said you want to support me. Would you do it? And it cost 5,000 to bring that toys shekels, which is like 250 Australian to bring the toys from one side of Palestine to the other side of Palestine, if you just even imagine. And I said, uncle, we have no money for the delivering. So he said, leave it with me. And at 8 a.m. with my coffee in the morning in the most beautiful house of my parents, this uncle was there with half of the amount. And I called a friend that was supporting me with all this work. And I said, hey, like, what should I do? This is like, I, I don't know what, like how I can do that. I don't know. Um, I wish that's, that's um, my parents' house, if you can see the photos. That's literally, I, I slept in here, in this room, and you see the bed. Every day I would just move all the toys and sleep and wake up in the morning and sort more, and every day and every day. Um, but there was $250, uh, dollars. that's the trailer, if you can see the, the toys as well there. They are taking it out in, in Gaza, and that's some of the toy libraries in there. So kind of, there's a lot to tell you. I'm just like, it's very hard to do it in one hour. Um, but I just have to say like, I really so proud of like all these people that I have worked with, all those people that have made it happen. Um, I wake up every day for a new miracle that happened in everywhere I do things, like a new thing happened. There's a seventh library on the beach of Gaza. It's what I think it's one of the only libraries in Palestine that's on the beach and toy library for moms to go there in summer and play with their children in a secured place and be able to go out and in and feeling okay. Um, and yeah, just, just that's me in one hour. And it's like the things I decided to talk about, but there's other things that I would love if you want to um, uh, share or think or ask, or I don't know. Come on, come on, guys, come back. I just want to say a massive thank you. Like, I feel really emotional hearing all the work you do. And uh, I just feel like you give fire in my belly. It's like if one woman can do everything and, and get people to come together in the way that you can, like, what, what, what is possible in this world? So, um, yeah, I just want to say deep, deep gratitude for your sharing tonight, Asil, and for who you are and that courage. I feel like you listen and you obey, you know, and you follow through to the end. And it's, yeah, it's really, it's an honor to know you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, opening up to questions, because I know that that's just the iceberg of the stuff that you do as well, the tip of the iceberg. So you can just unmute yourselves. Can everyone unmute themselves? I think, yeah. 
I have no questions as yet, but I, yeah, I, I just, I found that a very charming hour. Um, incredibly human and, and light filled. And Say told me that your name translates as original, which I think is perfectly apt. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think the work you do is, is incredible and inspirational. And uh, I have spent some time in Palestine and um, Jerusalem, spent a few months there and found it. Uh, this, this, they're called Jerusalem Syndrome on the English speaking side of Palestine. And uh, everyone I met told me that I'd been bitten seriously but I just found it the most transformational place. It actually changed the course of my life. And I met a young woman there who reminds me so much of you. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I salute you. I think the work you do is very beautiful and welcome. And how are you? Anytime you want to tell me, please give me a call. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. Thank you very much. Yeah, Jerusalem is one of the most beautiful places on earth. And I wish it so, so much. <laughs> Yeah. Come on, guys, ask me something. <laughs> Say something as well, if you want to. I was wondering why women can't sing. Well, um, so what people say in general, uh, so there was two things. I, I am a believer, and I believe with what our prophet says to us. And when people, when our prophet moved from his city to another one, he was born in Mecca and he moved to Medina and people welcomed him. It's called the Hijrah, which is coming soon. So people stand it on the, uh, on the front of the village. Imagine like people are waiting for people in the shores of Melbourne, you know? So they were waiting, welcoming him and they sang, uh, so that's a longer story, a longer, longer um, um, song. And the Prophet didn't stop women or anyone to sing. And um, people came to him and he said, but we, women should not sing or like in other things have done. Why did you stop them? And the Prophet said, I left things for you to decide on what is right and what is wrong to do. Because you cannot put every single rule in earth. There was no WhatsApp when the Prophet was Prophet. How on earth we would know WhatsApp is God or not? There was no airplanes. So people say it's forbidden for women to sing because they are emotional and they, they make other people get emotional or like, you know, men get emotional and attracted to them in a way. But I chose to sing because I want to change. And even if I knew that this is forbidden, I know my intention is much stronger than what people would think. So I do great things in this world. And if God will, you know, put me in troubles because I sang, well, I don't think that's fair. That's how my way of thinking about it. And I don't say that when people say you should not sing that they are wrong. I know that's a rule in a way, but I also chose my own, if that makes sense. What's your name? My name is Alkira. Akira, I'm so glad you were listening today. Yeah, it was so <laughs> lovely. It's wonderful. Thank you. Inspiring. I Very inspiring. You are so incredibly inspiring. Mm. Who, who is talking now? That was me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your name? Virgil. Virgil. Thank you, Virgil. Thank you very much. I loved watching you all, like, watching and sitting. And I, I cannot wait until my little one watch and see maybe you guys <laughs> talking about your things it's it was so amazing do you have other questions kakira no i don't have any more yeah. what about what's your name my name's lilia lilia you don't have any questions uh well i just wanted to say that i really like the idea of a toy library how amazing <laughs> is that you know, children haven't seen any of these toys in those places. They so, get so excited about just one small thing given to them. Mm -hmm. And we are so lucky. We don't even have playgrounds. When we walk around, one of the things I did, and, um, and uh, Rachel mentioned to me before, was a, a project called uh, Our Way to Heaven. I would just get one thing to show you. Just one moment. I love it. 
Because we have things to That is a project I did in, in Bunbury, Louise. I would just look at you every time I speak about Bunbury. And that is a project uh, I called Our Way to Heaven. And when I did that project, it was in Gaza 2014. And there were few children walking on the beach, playing with a ball. And um, 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 ship in the water, shoot them. I don't know if you heard about this, but they are called the Abu Bakr family. The three children went to pieces. And I came to Australia that year, and I saw all these playgrounds on the beach, all the places that people play, all the, all the things we are so lucky to have in, in Australia. And I just wondered, like, why cannot we just have that? Why we cannot just sit at the beach and play? Why cannot even, like, all the playgrounds I know in Gaza were bombed every time there's a war on Gaza. And then I gathered all my friends' toys on the beach and I created a whole line inside the water. And I went into, can you see the toys? So the toys were moved because of the, of the water, of the, you know, wave. But I walked all the way until I was cover, covered all in water. And I just kind of, it was a performance just telling to people, telling people that it's, it's so hard. Like you, you have no idea how heaven is this place is and what other people are suffering around the world. And it was like a beach full of people that just looked, who's this crazy woman just putting toys into a line. But I just, <laughs> I just wanted to walk with all these toys and, you know, kind of give a statement and make them feel like that I am weird and come and ask. But of course, there no one came to me and just like looked at me like, you know, who is this crazy woman? But I just wanted to show that and explain to them that, you know, some places are not really um, safe. And those children just went for one day walk on the beach to play and they didn't come back. And they have families and they have people. They now died, but they have families that would every time look at them. They have cousins that played just next to them that survived and will never, ever forget that things that we have seen on that beach. So yes, we are so lucky to have toy libraries and libraries in general. And you know, you have no idea how children sat there when I started the toy libraries. I wish I could show you photos. The children in one of that, the very first toy library that was finished, there was lines of 200 children outside the library waiting for their turns because they don't have anything like that. So, and then my phone and my messenger didn't stop. It's like, can we have toys too? But I don't help individuals. I work on community projects. I work on something that is sustainable and continuous. But people didn't only pick for, for um, uh, toys. They picked for one packet of milk that I couldn't send to them because I didn't want to start a wave of things coming to me. But this is how sad situations are there. So, yes, we're just so lucky. What I think is so beautiful, Asil, is, is how you can, you can put all these experiences into, into an art form. You, you, have, you seem to have an endless creativity to be able to, to turn these experiences as hard as they might be for you and for everybody who experiences in, in Palestine. You have this ability to turn it into something so powerful, which it's, it's just amazing. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Hang on, say again. My name is Julie, Hi, Julie. And I'm wondering, hello. <laughs> I'm wondering what room you're in now because it's so beautiful on, mm -hmm. on behind you. And what does it mean? How about I take you in my house? So you see. Oh. <laughs> so that is coming in the entrance. That's, that's uh, it's not our hands, but it's just a sticker. Yeah. Forgive the miss, if there's still a miss. That's our kitchen. <laughs> Lovely. And that's our like kind of like dining room. Yeah. And what is written on the wall is God will not change you unless you change within yourself. I mean, which will not change your situation unless you change it yourself. Uh, that also is our living room. I will tell you another story now that I'm showing you my room. These um, stamps 
my husband used to collect when he was a child. Maybe your age, guys, little ones. And those are photos from our travels. So, and that's our Eid Mubarak that we painted recently because we didn't have anything to do. So we painted Eid Mubarak on Eid just to do an art activity when we cannot give leave home. Uh, and my husband collected all of these things maybe he, when he was primary school. And there was like books of them. But when Syria, he, my husband's from Syria, and when Syria was occupied when, and when ISIS was in Raqqa, uh, um, they demolished everything. They bombed everything. And my parents, my yeah, parents low house was as like people stole everything they have. But because my mother-in-law knew how much these stamps are dear to my husband, she kept them. Every time she went from place to a place, like in her book, Jay, she kept those small stamps in books and books and books. And I haven't seen my mother-in-law for like eight years. And we met last year in Dubai. And one of the most important and beautiful moments in which she gave it to my husband, all of them, to like, just for him to see it. So everywhere in our room, there's lots of them. There's a collection of like, like hundred year old stamps that we still have in there. So that's my house. And he, that's, he took four months to just create that artwork as well. Beautiful. Your husband? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Come on, Saeed, do something. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, it's not. I'm it's, speechless. It's very <laughs> inspirational, Asil. It's it's just awesome to see what you've done. It's, thank you, thank yeah. you very much. It's it's not his writing. Just to confirm, we took the design and we worked on it. So you know, no pressure, side. You can print it too. <laughs> No, I think he means your body of work. Yeah, no, not that, yeah. yeah. I know, I know, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm just... <laughs> we'll give that one a go as well. No, as I love that, please. I'm happy to give you, but just so you know, this is, this is, like, he printed it, he's an architect, so he printed it in four different pieces, and he stenciled every single letter and every single shape mm. first, and then he made all the holes, he used the pencil to create, to make it on the wall with each single, single one. And then he colored it all with pencil to see how it would look like before he painted. Then cleared it all and just left the outline and then colored it in again with the colors. So it took a long time. Yeah, I can see. Can, I wanted to ask you, I, I find relationships, intimate relationships, when, when you come from such extraordinary okay. parts of the world and you carry such um, a depth of, of material in your box here, book here, how I, I'm always fascinated how people meet, how you come to a point in your life that's been so full of um, challenge and opportunity. Um, and clearly you've listened to your voice so very mindfully and at what point when you meet that person who you decide to create your own world with, because you are creating your own world anew, if you've left that much of what is home to you, how you and your husband, how you met and what that means to you now, what home and place means for you to, um, I mean, I'm, I, I didn't grow up in Bunbury, I'm from Perth, but my sense of home, loss of home is great. It's not as great as yours or Saeed's, but the sense of moving away from what is home and familiar and all of those sort of things that build you as a child, how you and your, your husband now go about building that sense of home and, and how that informs your life and the way you live and your art. And oh, Such a hard question, Eloise. That's why you have been laughing all the time? Is that just preparing this <laughs> question no <it> doesn't like... <laughs> no you're um, very funny that's why <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually i am uh, rachel i'm thinking to uh, have a i'm a very good cook and i cook lots of dishes from home so i will think i will send it to you so you can share it with the team i love like i i'm kind of thinking to have um with a friend of mine that he's a comedian but we laugh a lot and we share a lot of um 
and music and cooking and so on together. So I, I teach him lots of dishes and I say, why don't we share it with other friends that you know would like to cook with us? So I will share it with you, Rachel, and you can send it to people. But answering your question, when I met my husband, he wasn't, I didn't really meet with him and kind of like we were in love. We, I met him and he was my first really great friend. And um, we spoke, we met online because of other friends that we have in common and because he took a photo of a friend of mine and that's kind of a longer story, you don't want to hear it. But um, um, then like we were talking about all the things I hated in my community and all the things I loved and all the things I didn't care about, all the things I was passionate about, about me not caring about having anything, not even a wedding ring or any gold or whatever, all this bullshit and all this kind of things that I should not even think about and how this community is like built on all this kind of tradition that is like so show off and so what do you have and whatever. So all of these things were so so clear for me that this is a person I want to be with. And when I met Emil, he was in his way here and he's from Syria and me and him cannot be in the same country in, together. I carry Israeli passport and my husband carry Syrian. We are the most enemies in the world. We cannot be <laughs> in the same place, yeah? So like 70 years of silent war, but no, you, it's a forbidden, you cannot be together. And even when you went, we went to Jordan to get married. And when the people then looked at our uh, passports, they said, <laughs> like, they didn't want to get, get us married. And they took the, took the paper and didn't want us to be together. It took like, I think 45 or something stamps for me and my husband to get together, okay? And the permission of the, the foreigner affair minister or something like this in Jordan to have us, you know, married because they took us took the paper. My husband was going back to Syria uh, to to um, Australia, and I'm going back to Palestine. And they said, "Come in two weeks. What two weeks? Give us the paper. We cannot stay here for two weeks. We have to go tomorrow. We have a flight, you know." And said, so "Then start like then like I don't know how it is, but it's Arab way. Like, uh, come in two weeks. I agree. You can't come in two weeks. Okay, stand in the line. That's like kind of how crazy things are." <laughs> <laughs> so we stand in the line we waited and waited and then we went upstairs the upstairs kind of level of the minister and they he gave us the permission otherwise we were still not you know we're still waiting for that paperwork but it's hard it's hard and still in the line yes still, like to be in the line was the easiest and he gave us knafe which is the best part but the other thing that happened that my mom didn't want to let go as well because i'm her oldest i'm like you know I think everybody that has a child or is an oldest child knows what an oldest means. Akira, you will know when you grow up. And and an oldest is the word for whoever, like, you know, is a mom. And my mom, I had my hina on my hand. And she said, can you not go? I was engaged and married, actually married in Jordan, 10 months before I got married to my husband. And she still was trying to convince me not to go. So, and she hated him. She said to me, she said to him, I don't know what in you, my, my, my daughter, but she, she made my, his life hell before we got married. But once she met him, she understood. I said to her, I want to put my head on the pillow and be relaxed and trust that that's the only person I want to be in the world with. And now I see him and think about it. I cannot do all of this, all I did with any other man in the world. I just don't know if I could ever do it. Like, I just, and he's the right person. When I said to him, I was sending $2,000 to the people in Gaza and people will send this to us. Another man would look at me like, are you crazy? But he trusts, he trusts in me. He trusts in people's trust. And that, and that what made me continue being like this, like so hard to be this woman for my parents, trust me, like to, for my friends, for my family in places where it was so hard for them to see me, the different girl. And I have heard so much hard things that, you know, I wouldn't even share. But being with him, the home, is that, that moment when I put my shoulder in his and feel that there's nothing on this world will change and nothing will maybe make me scared once he is there. I don't know if that answers your question and puts lots of pressure on Saeed, but that's kind of what is the... <laughs> That's what reality is. <laughs> oh.
Oh, I want to hear what he's saying. That's not fair. <laughs> he said you didn't hear any of that, did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Eloise? Yeah, that was very beautiful. I think it um, it becomes about, yeah, place becomes kind of like the promised land, doesn't it? It becomes a uh, an abstract place in the company of, of people. And because yeah. we we are share, we're sharing lots of values, everything in this house you have seen, either a gift or a second-hand thing. We don't care mm. about the best fashion. Look at me talking to you with my hoodies. I don't really care about anything about that. Like there's my children, my child's clothes is like always from other friends. I remember maybe buying, going shopping two or three times since she was born for her, just because she really got out of it and I didn't have time to ask friends for anything else. And I give a lot much more than I take. And I think because we share this, if there's no mortgage, we would just be kind of really making much more project than we can. I think, you know, the secret of any kind of safe, place is like agreeing and agreement and understanding and support and i can see that in your eyes uh julie and uh, virgil and i can see that in yours Said and louise and i'm sure that you know that's what keep you going and even like you know not only for me that's kind of the secret of life i guess virgil you wanted to say something before before we laughed at louise and Said. No, no, I was, I'm just going to let you hear what Julie said, but now it was just a reaction, a very nice reaction to your story. What did you say? I said, oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nathan, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I had a question. I've been, I've been sort of framing it as you've been talking, um, answering other questions. And so I hope it comes out clearly enough. Um, I don't want to deal with politics very much, but I would like to talk about the culture of Palestine. Um, the reason why I'm asking this is because I found a lot of your photos to be very revealing, uh, especially the photos of the toy library. So many smiling faces, they, they really catch your, you know, they really catch your attention. And yet I saw a majority of the women not wearing the headscarf. So it made me realize, well, I know a little bit about Israel. I know more about the Jewish side of Israel than I do the Palestinian side. Um, and there is a bit of a divide between secular Israelis and traditional uh, religious Israelis. Is there a divide like that in the Palestinian community? Uh, yes. and, and how is that, how, how does that play a role in the art that you create? Uh, or does it at all? Well, it does, it does have a difference, uh, but it's not like that kind of Israeli culture or like religion, because there's a huge gap between the two communities. Like, you know, I don't know what's your background and what you, how much you know about that, but there's a huge difference between the, um, um, the religious community in Israel and the non-religious community in Israel. But it's not the same in Palestine. And I think maybe, I, I cannot speak about that, but in, it's not really the same in Iran, especially for like the government and the enforcement of lots of tradition and religion. Um, in Palestine, it's not the same. It's like in Palestine, I can be wearing a hijab and my sister not. So there's a big difference of the way it is. The hijab is kind of, it's not really forced on in people. Some families of course do, always do, but it's a, not mostly a, a decision we make. I when I wore my hijab, I was 13, and I didn't want to hear all these men kind of talking about me and about my hair and whatever, and I chose to do it. And my parents both refused me wearing it because they said, you are still young, what are you talking about? Who will make the prey to school? They're not trying to convince me not to wear it. When my auntie supported my decision and took me to Nablus and wear it, like got me all the clothes. And I still, until this moment, even when I came, when I was in, I was the only Palestinian Arab, hijabi, Muslim, that studied in the, in the course of art before I started adding more children. In, and the rest were Israelis, religious and non-religious. And one day, the, girl, the lady in the library said to me, Asil, you are so free. Why don't you take your hijab off? I said, I'm that free that I want to decide to put it on. And that's a big difference between what people think of freedom and what people 
you know, imagined freedom. And it's totally not really related to like how religious you are. If you decided some people are not really, don't even pray, but wear a hijab. And some people really pray all the time, five times, very strict, and they don't put a hijab. I think hijab and non-hijab is something between a person and his God and what he believes. It shouldn't be anyone's enforcement on any person on earth. And when that happens, that actually makes it harder for people to even trust or believe that because you cannot force people with a stick to do what you want. You need to give them the freedom to that mind to really decide what they want to do. And that's kind of, I don't know if that answered it, but that's kind of explaining to you as well what the difference is. I, I appreciate I appreciate that that response. Um, I I really enjoy being in Malaysia because Malaysia offers such a cross section of Asia, not only Muslim Asia, but Asia of all, of all kinds. Um, but here I've had the chance to befriend a number of Persians um, and learned that many Persians outside of, of, uh, uh, of Iran are, are very secular. Um, and according to these that I've met, um, there are a lot of secular uh, Muslims in Iran as well, but they're, they're not able to reveal themselves or, or do what they want. So um, in Palestine, or at least let's just say in Jerusalem, um, they would be able to. So do you see a lot of secularized Muslims in, in Jerusalem, for example? I know that's yeah. a very religious city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, Jerusalem is very religious, but the people who live in it doesn't necessarily be Muslim even the first place. Jerusalem have Jewish, Christians and Christians, Muslims. Yeah, yeah. And within Jerusalem, like the where, where I raised for like the first 15 years of my life and more later on, there's many people. Like, like you walking in the street and see like some Haridim and some other people and some other, like there's so many mm. different religions. And even like, um, like within the Jewish community, there's so many different levels of religious, like religious people that walking around, same is for Muslims, same is in Iran. Some people believe in that, some people don't believe in that. Some people believe in it and wear it because they have to. Some don't really believe in it and don't wear it. And like, there's like, I think, I don't see Palestine as a difference. Like some, in, in Gaza, people might be more religious because of also who rules in Gaza. Um, and some people will have to maybe wear hijab, but at least those I know, those around me, those I can speak on their behalf and give myself the right, have chosen with eyes blind to do this because they love it. And some people, when they realize that's not what they want, they also took it off and they have faced, like, of course, the two sides of like blaming them. Why did you do this? That's haram. And also face those that you look so beautiful. We welcome you as you are. I think that's not a Palestinian thing. That's a worldwide thing of like having this division. Women have similar experiences as, as I've heard from various people in Malaysia, in Malaysia, because it's, a, it's very much a choice in Malaysia. Um, so there are a multitude of reasons to wear the hijab or not wear the hijab in Malaysia. And, it's, and they're, they're not always religious. Um, yes. It, it can be very much a matter of convenience. I'll get a better job if I wear the hijab. I don't want men hassling me, so I wear their job. Those are just two you know, quick, quick reasons that I can think of. Mm. that I've heard so yeah, yeah. sorry I, I, I don't want to no, 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 derail exactly. this away like, from I, arts I had wanted to um, just hear a bit about that because I've, I've never been to Israel um, uh, and I, I don't have a good feel for the Palestinian community in Israel outside of the occupied areas in Jerusalem for example yeah, well, we um, they can call it all Palestine for us. I that's Palestinian occupied place, more occupied place, less occupied place, hell, less hell, but it's all called Palestine for me. Um, and I lived there and have lots of Israeli friends that um, um, I love so much, and I'm still in so much deep relationship with them. Actually, my wedding that my mom didn't want to go to in Jordan, I had two Israeli friends of mine coming with me because they were my teacher and my closest friend. Uh, and they went with me to every single protest I've been to in Palestine, and they are very pro-Palestinians. But one day I went to Jerusalem with Daphna, with one of my closest friends, and I went to one of the African communities in Palestine, and uh, in Jerusalem, just two minutes away from Al-Aqsa, from where the Dome of the Rock is. And if you lived in Jer uh, Jerusalem, Eloise, you know where I'm talking, what I'm talking about. And I went with Daphna to a place, um, and she was sitting there silently, not talking to anyone. 
and she was really my closest friend and for me I have been seven years in Australia I don't also have any closer friend than her um, but the, guy, the guys asked her in that organization I used to volunteer in where are you from and because she have lots of respect to me even if she carries Israeli passport just like me she said to him I'm from here because she she cannot say I'm Palestinian because she will be lying and she doesn't want to say Israeli because she doesn't want to say that even if she carries the same passport. So he said, ah, oh, you're a Palestinian. He's a Tunisian guy, he's from Tun Tunisia. So he said, ah, oh, you're a Palestinian. She said, well, actually, no, I'm not. And they kicked her out from that place because they say they didn't want her to be there, which I understand because they face the Israeli soldiers every day in their way to the mosque, in their way to the bakery, in their way to heaven, into their way into everything. The Israelis are surrounding them. But I couldn't go back to that place, even if they are my friends, because of what they did to my friends. But that's kind of a very rare situation because I have an amazing um, friend to like fight the, the word with. She will stand with me against every soldier in any protest. But it was kind of interesting. But for me, again, like for me, I would never say it is Israel. It's a place that Israel is 70 years old, while Palestine has been much, much older than that. So yeah, just saying. Said, do you want to say something? Can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Asil. Uh, my name is Giordano. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. I came in uh, a bit late, so I missed the beginning of the conversation. It's OK. Thank you, Giordano. Can um, we see you? Uh, can you? No, we can't. Oh, sorry. Is my video not on? No. Oh, sorry. Hang on. Unless it's a video silent that we can see. Oh, uh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Hang on. Yeah. Here we go. Hi. Yes. Yeah, great to see someone that you're talking to. <laughs> sorry, I thought my video was on the whole time. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, I, I thought that just on what you just said now, I thought um, that would be a good uh, lead in for a, a, a slightly more political question because I think everything you've said is political in a sense, the re whole reason that you're here and much of the work that you do is, uh, is political and you introduce as yourself as an artist from occupied Jerusalem. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I I've been, I mean, the whole world is at the moment focusing on the pandemic and everything, but at the same time behind the scenes, there's this annexation uh, plan that is, um, that is um, about to go ahead that that the, I imagine that Palestine and the occupied territories are, are bracing themselves for um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what um, I assume you have family there that you keep in touch with and what is the situation now like back home um, in this moment yeah well I want to believe if I am being super clear, like super open, I want to believe that this is not something that's going to happen. Where my parents live is called um, the Triangle, and that's what they keep talking about, about like bringing or adding to the West Bank. Um, that's kind of like in a nutshell for even like the, the younger ones in, in the room to understand. And like that's also the same thing that they have been talking about for a longer time. Um, the Israeli plan is much bigger than Palestine and like the more they take in Palestine, I don't know if you have seen photos of the disappearing Palestine, I would say, not Palestine. Um, um, just for a moment. So in Palestine, that's what we know, that's what we had and that's what we have now. And not even then, this is like even less than this. And what's happening in in Palestine now is like us trying to like fight first the occupation and second the pandemic and third to kind of fight in between to keep the rest of whatever is left from the land um, happening and like what the plan is I don't know if you have seen the wall or around Palestine and the plan is like to add to that wall and the whole kind of division from the beginning is, is like a whole longer plan that slowly, slowly reveals some of it. I wouldn't go to politics because I don't even follow that. I try, I was interrogated a lot in the, in the 
last like life in their last like since I was a, a girl I saw my parents being beaten every time we took the, the bus from Jerusalem where I was born to where I my parents are from and and I was integrated in Hong Kong for three hours for why I'm going back to Palestine two months after I left it to go to my sister within so I prefer not to really go any deeper than that I kind of keeping my activism as simple as it is because I have been in lots of trouble and I really hope that you that's something you appreciate and I just say that's kind of all I can answer if that if that's okay sure but I don't want to be prevented from going back home that's all I'm trying to say in a very safe polite way sure. but yes I, I'm happy um Rachel if you um, link us together or even if you email me into my um, account I'm happy to chat much much longer than that and talk about other things but uh, yeah I prefer to keep it that short okay. that's okay. I can I can send out your email address Cecile. yeah okay. of course yeah anyone have Alicia do you want to say anything hi uh can, hi, my name's Beck. Can you see hi, me? Beck. Yes, yes, we can see you. I would just like to say thank you for that. Um, I had to leave halfway because my youngest had a, was tantruming. Sorry, but I came back. Um, but I just wanted to say your voice is so beautiful and I, I just thank you for singing thank you thank you very much in 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 also in terms of what what it means for you to redefine a voice and um to i just cannot tell you i'm listening to you over zoom but when you sing it's just extraordinary like whatever is in there um you know, it's helped me understand your plight. And I, I, I just want to say, keep singing. Like it's, I, I feel, I just want to hear more. <laughs> I just think it's so beautiful and, 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 and to break taboo and to do what you're doing with your art. And, um, it's, yeah, I've only heard it digitally, but hopefully one day I can hear it in the flesh. Thank you yeah. for that. Thanks. I might share with you, a song I sang now um, to Beirut um, just because I think talking about all of this um, I remember all my brothers and sisters and families and friends that have just experienced a crazy time and very hard uh, time for them um, and um, um, like it has been a hard few days for us and for anyone and when my psychologist asked me, ah, I didn't know you are Lebanese. I said like, no, I'm not Lebanese. I'm just, <laughs> I, I'm allowed to be sad for what, what is happening. And I want to sing for you one song. Um, I, I'm just looking for this, for the, for the lyrics. So I don't just sing it, but it says, Li Beirut min qalbi salam, to Beirut from my heart, peace. وَقُبَلٌ لِلْبَحْرِ وَالْبُيُوتِ and kisses to the sea and to the houses and to a rock as it was as it is as if as if it is a face of an old sailor Beirut is a soul of the people it's wine it's a, um, it, it's, it's the wine and bread and jasmines how on earth it smells just like fire and smoke that's the word, and I'm gonna sing the words for you. And I really hope you also just like sing the best um, um, wishes to the people there, just to kind of to hold on, because they have been through a lot. And it's just the minimum we can do. Just like send them like as much energy as you can. <laughs> من قلبي سلام لبيروت وقبل للبحر والبيوت لصخرة كأنها 
وجه بحار قديم هي من روح الشعب خمر هي من عرقه خبز وياسمين فكيف صار طعمها طعم نار ودخان لبيروت مجد من دماد لبيروت من دم لولد حمل فوق يدها أطفأت مدينة قندينها أغلقت بابها أصبحت في السماء وحدها وحدها ودائري لبيروت uh, owner of um, the thing that comes out of the fire the grey thing I forgot Ash, is it Ash? The Beirut owner of Ash, the Beirut from um, a blood of a, a baby that was carried on her hand. She turned the lights, her candle off, she closed her door and she stayed on the sky by herself, by herself and the night. <coughs> That's the song. I hope you guys like it. Alicia, you wanted to say something, and I, and then Olive, um, not Olive, but, um, okay, what's her name? Sorry. What was your name? Sorry, I forgot. Beck. Beck. Beck started talking when you, Alicia, started to talk. Do you want to say something? Uh, no, I feel, I don't, I don't think I have any words that can, that can follow after you. I think that, I mean, the thing that you show me is, um, I think when you have people in places who are suffering and who are, um, it's, it's hard sometimes to, you, you can be paralyzed by this feeling of helplessness. Um, and I think what you are showing is things can be done. And um, that is very inspiring. Thank you. Um, um, I don't know what your name because it's a Y, and I wanted to like. Hello, Hello. I'm Hello. Yuki. Sorry. So, what's your name? Yuki. Yuki. Yeah. So I'm actually Rachel's housemate. So. Oh, um, yeah, we're we're on separate computers, but we're in the same property. Oh, God. Um, I've met you once when you talked over at Darabin. Um, you you sang for the group that Rachel was helping to mentor, and it was beautiful to see you sing in person and to hear your story. But I had no idea how many layers and how much courage was hidden hidden just below the surface. So it's really amazing to see a bit more of your story and to. Yeah, to feel, I feel so privileged to just hear some of the things that you have been through and, and the things that you, the way that you turn difficult situations and you try and, yeah, you convert them into, into positivity and, and um, find a way to really harness those things and make good out into the world and I love the one project at a time because it really means that you focus on one thing but if everybody focused on one thing and did something to make the world better if everybody did that then we would have all the power that we needed to make the changes that we did so it's so wonderful to hear you tell your story and feel inspired that you know, just by you speaking out, you can have a ripple effect on so many other lives and make us inspired to take on a little project and, and do that change ourselves within the sphere of 
influence that we have. So I'm so honoured to have been part of tonight and, and to hear your story and please keep sharing. Thank you very much. Can I, can I just ask a question? There was such beautiful singing. I, was that the melody from Rodrigo's guitar concerto? I think so. I think yeah. so. I don't really <laughs> like, know, but, but yes. I think. But, da, 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 da. Yeah, I was yeah. going, wow, and this is very familiar, but um, that was beautiful to hear the crossover between those two things. Actually, I just did a call out for artists. I know, I don't, I, I when, when Andrews uh, announced that we're going to have a lockdown and my ha daughter have to stay at home with me, I said, you know what, let's have a break. Let me just like, you know, switch off all the, the bottoms in my head and have a break. And then the thing in Beirut did. And can you think I can ever have a break when that's happening? So we did a call for artists to bring people together, like musicians and um, singers from all around the world to come and sing the same song, but in different kind of languages and different contributions, just to make it like from the world to Beirut. And hopefully we'll do it in the next like three, four days. Um, and I will share it also with you, Rex, to share it with people. Yeah, that would be amazing. Like I have talked to so many people that want to do it, like people from European, different artists and like, can we do this, can we do this, can we do this? And like, that's amazing. Like the love and support, it's just huge. And it's sad when something like this happened in Amsterdam and not even as much how the world was standing and everything is great. And when it's kind of our countries, it's, it's as well, we're used to them. They always have explosions. Like when one, one more one is like not the big deal. Um, so, yeah, but let's do something, Melbournians, let's do something. Uh, I don't know what to say. David Cameron, I would love to hear from you because you have been hearing me since the beginning. You were the very first person to come in as well, almost. We cannot hear you still. Hey. Uh, um, look, I've been um, sitting here enraptured by your singing, taking in all the stories, listening to the profound depths with which you transform pain and the very long tortured history of your people. Um, and just thinking how much it makes me think about the course of history for so many peoples in the world. It's just so curious that only two nights ago, I listened to a very detailed account of the Palestinian story on a, um, a radio national program, which I listened to religiously. And it just happens that having listened to that particular account gave me considerable insight into the very story that you were telling, um, at least the politics, the sociology and the background. I've always been terribly interested in this part of the world because um, I have many roots that go back on all sides. My mother went, as, uh, shortly after the Second World War, she went with my biological father to spend time on the kibbutz in Israel in a period when the socialist side of the movement to transform Palestine into an Israeli homeland for the Jews was still at the earliest pioneering stages everything was to be shared, nobody owned anything. And it was an attitude to life that um, made a lot of sense to my mother, having been kept like a, a hen cooped up in a little cage in Switzerland through the war, um, because I'm Swiss born and she's Swiss born. So I have lots of background, lots of family relationships with Jewish history, um, most of it on the secular side and a, a biological father who was himself in his life very paranoid about anti-Semitism. And it was a theme that ran through right through his life and brought him considerable anguish and grief. So I've been listening very closely and carefully to other people's questions, to your answers. Um, as a number of the people listening in are my children or my children-in-law or grandchildren, and you've been speaking to a number of them, I have a large family of thought of children as such a wonderful gift. One of my children is right here next to me, Angelica. Um, 
and as was mentioned by Rachel at the beginning, it's now only um, two and a half weeks since I had open heart surgery and I'm in the still very early trouble stages of recovery from that. But um, I was very deeply moved by all of your stories, all of your courage, and particularly the gift to children that a lot of your initiatives represent the work you did with children in Palestine, in Jerusalem, and the initiative to get toys to them. It's interesting that my grandmother on my mother's side actually herself was a designer and designed dolls for children and made many other toys for children. Uh, she made them by hand. She made dolls that became iconic in a certain uh, environment within Switzerland and broadly across the world. There were children that didn't have the expressions that in the Western world we put onto dolls, which try to uh, portray adult um, attitudes. It leaves the face of the child basically bland for the child that plays with the doll to put their own interpretation of the emotion of that doll and the emotions that they themselves carry into the doll itself. And a great many of the dolls that my grandmother made were dolls that represented people from all ethnicities and cultures. Many of them were inspired in North Africa, in the Middle East, and many other parts of the world. So um, there are a lot of themes that come together to make a lot of what you've portrayed be very meaningful to me personally. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. And thank you for being here and all these kind of um, help things as well. Thank you. Rachel, come on, it's 10 o'clock. You should scale it off. <laughs> I can't stop you. I want more, more, more. <laughs> oh, it was such a beautiful night. Like, you know, in this lockdown, it's so, so hard to feel related to people. And like, I mean, like to keep, um, uh, you know, this kind of conversations and at this time of the night as well when like I am, I cannot wait when my daughter sleeps so I can run under the bed and like, have good time, but um, yeah, that's um, that's that has been one of the most beautiful nights since this lockdown and since a long time as well. So I don't know, I don't want to leave, but I also want to. Tomorrow is another day and a weekend, so you know how crazy it is. <laughs> but you were my heart, guys. Like you really made me feel so so like welcomed and loved, and that really means the world for me. Mm. Julia, you want to say something? Come on, Julia, say something. Julie? Yes, Julie, Julie. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful to listen to and so inspiring. And um, I can't wait to meet you in person and hear more. Yes. Where do you guys live? More projects. Oh, right next to Rachel. Oh, Rachel, you just invited the neighborhood. Yes. <laughs> Come over. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I would love to. Look, one day I will come. I promise. Once this lockdown is finished, Rachel, let me know. And I will just come and bring some of our Middle Eastern kind of dishes and we can all cook together. I won't cook. Uh, no, I don't know how I would say that, but I mean, I, I don't know. We will find out a way to cook together and make a meal or meals together. That would be a fun time. A concert. A home concert. Yes, and I will. I will be singing and tell you what to cut and how to cut it. <laughs> yes, yes, please. <laughs> I just want to say, to finish up, like, something that I feel so inspired is just how, like, you talk about humanity and, and I feel like you have such a deep love for humanity, which I share. I share passion and love for humanity. And something that... Um, I, I will take from tonight is just like you give, you give of yourself. And I feel like in something I love and I've been so blessed to be able to travel to many countries. And, and what I'm drawn to is that expression of self and expression of what it is to be human, all those emotions. And, and I struggle in Australia sometimes that there's this kind of holding back of what people, you know, like of who people are, what they want to express in that moment. And I'm going to take away more, more courage to express who I am more fully. So thank you for, for modeling that, for being that. And I would just me. maybe ask one thing, Rachel, thank you for sharing this. And like that, like you did, Louise, I think 
like one thing I would love you to take out and that's kind of like recently in June after Bukje, um, there was one uncle in the street that um, have um, like I always see and he always tease me and like the Palestinians like I, I tease everybody in the in the shops like I walk in the shop and like say hello to everybody and how are you but I need to talk to them you know and like you know just make friendships and stuff and there's one uncle that always sees me and like he's the Palestinian the Palestinian came like the Palestinian girls here you know so I was telling him about a story of an Ahwazi woman that I saw and she was she just lost her dad and it's locked down and she couldn't see him for the last 10 years because she has a big family and she cannot go back to live and like to visit them and I was crying just telling him the story and one other guy told me about this uncle that you haven't heard his his story and I didn't of course because I didn't want to ask him unless he shares and I said to him uncle do you want to talk to me about it and we walked to the Leyland library and sat there and spoke for like two and a half hours and the next day, I had an interview with a Churchill Fellowship. I did like, I was shortlisted twice and then I didn't get it. But one of the people that recommended me on that, the fellowship wrote, which is the Multicultural Art Victoria CEO. She wrote that, I, after other, out of other things, she wrote she's unstoppable. So out of all the questions this person asked me was, your, your referee said you are unstoppable. Can you tell me why? So it was the day after that person told me all these stories and it was a very surprising question because what I applied for is more children's theatre. Why on earth you will ask me this question, you know? And I just couldn't answer that question. I looked at him and I cried and I said, well, yesterday was one of the hardest days because after I spoke to this uncle, I went home and I cried, cried, cried. I did a Facebook Post and says, come on, stop being that ignorant. This person haven't seen his children for the last 10 years. And I was like, so, so sad. But the next morning I had an interview about something I'm so passionate about. So I said to him, Quill, he's like, you have three, three uh, titles before his name. And then his name is Philip. And I said, well, Phil, <laughs> let me tell you about how crazy my life was yesterday. How hard it was one of the hardest days of my life. And here I am. Like forgetting all about it for a moment and talking so passionately to you about what I do. The day after, after I wrote a whole TEDx talk that I wanted to give, I didn't, I like rushed that and I just simply spoke about the uncle that I spoke to about his story and about the guy in, in Bunbury that never standed to listen to my story. And I won the best TEDx speaker on that night of like 15 different other people that did it. So, and then the only thing I'm asking you and everybody else that ever listened to me is to really care. Like, I don't save, I don't think about anything, but because I trust that, I, as a believer, trust in God fully. And like since, and you can believe this or not, since COVID started, I have done different kind of charity things, but every single dollar I got out, I got back in either grants or help, or like a gift or th like every single thing. So don't save things because you will think, of course, be wise, but just give, just give. Like miracles happen when you do give. And I tell you this from deep, the deepest point of my heart, just do it, give it in talks, in money, in gifts, in a smile. Like whenever I stand on a, on a traffic light and people laugh, I just look around and say hello to people. And they think I'm an idiot. But I just do it because I love it. And that's a giving, you know, just do it. Do it any single time you can. You never know how long you would live. Just make every day a day you would be so proud of. I do that every day. And there's no one night in so much pain. I have, I live with a chronic pain and this sitting is, will kill me tonight. But there's no one night I didn't go to sleep and say that was amazing day, you know. And that should be for every single person of you because you deserve it and the world does deserve people like just to do this you know we are so lucky to be here we are so lucky to be with the ones we love with the family we have and care about just make other people so lucky too with just sometimes one smile with telling people what a beautiful haircut with like just commenting on how amazing dress is i do that all the time people think i'm stupid but i love it like people are really that's just um really like that makes the day to 
many people. People just don't realize how amazing these comments we make to people. Just be those people you want to meet in the street. And trust me, it's contagious. Like, it will be much better than, than COVID. Trust me. Then at least we will not be in lockdown. We'll be sharing the love outside. I see you. I see you, um, I, read, I read something within the past month, um, and, and I think it was in conjunction with Black Lives Matter movement in the US, um, that was talking about the history of this question, how are you? And this person pointed out that often when we talk about, when we ask the question, how are you? We are actually asking, how are you with me? Do you feel safe with me? Do you feel threatened by me? And you can automatically see the answer in the person's face and and then that evolved into a form of greeting because you, you don't really need an answer if you're asking how are you with me anyway that may that may help you to see that in a little bit of a different way i've also had problems with that question as an adult i grew up with it you know as part of my culture um but uh that helped me to sort of where see were you it in born, a different Nathan? way where were you i'm from born? a u.s military background I was born on a military base and traveled extensively my, my whole life. Yeah. 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 Well. yeah. Would you guys go to sleep? Come on, let me go to sleep. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Love you so much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Bye, Hood. Bye. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Bye. Oh, Thank just you. one one thing um to donate i was thinking maybe i just send the bank details of asil if people want to donate to her um cause and all the things send uh, if she has paypal as well as well because international bank transfers are too expensive yeah do you have paypal yes i do yes. have paypal I, ha I have i have paypal but at the moment i'm not really running anything but you can choose anything of what like I'm, I'm really not running any campaigns or fundraising, but you, well, that's not true. There's one for the book of book J. I am, um, um, but I didn't ask people for money because I know everybody is, you know, everybody is not really doing much at the moment, but there's a book we're doing for children and talking, like we are creating a children character that will go and find out what people have in their own book J and make a book mm. of like, you know, what people have in their own book J, how was their journey, how we can help them. Just kind of a small, children books to kind of make this whatever I've told you today about more accessible for children and their parents to teach so but don't worry about that that's not why I was here and no no the last thing just, I, oh, I know of course not but that's something that that I feel like me and other people would like to support um I just thought one thing to just close off if we just go around and say what's one thing that you would take in your book uh. so, we we'll start with, you can have a few seconds to think about it. My three favorite hats. Your three favorite hats. Mm. For me, it would be my needle and thread. You might have seen, but I've been hand stitching. And for me, this is a, it's a patchwork bag that I'm making. Um, it's actually a, a, an activity that the library in Yarra, the Yarra City Library was running free and I thought I'd do it. But it's been so therapeutic for me to just have something to focus on and create beauty and sort of calm myself when there's so much craziness happening in the world. The other thing would be my pillow because if I have a good night's sleep, <laughs> then everything seems fine in the morning. <coughs> Yes. Mm. Um, I, for me, what I would bring with me, I would bring baskets to collect things in because I love collecting things. Today I finished making this basket with wrap. Wow. And I'm another one. Wow. Awesome. Beautiful. And I was going okay. to say that I found it very inspiring to listen to this. Thank you, love. Thank you. And I one day would like one of those baskets. If you are Rachel's friend, I would come and get some of her bread and one of your baskets and <laughs> your kids' pillow. I, that would be my donation. <laughs> would you make me one? Yes. Great. <laughs> okay, I will send you then my address. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
What about you guys, uh, Saeed and Eloise? Ah, well, let's wait, wait to hear from Julie and Virgil what you are going to take with you. Oh, the beautiful singing and, and just energy. Energy and, <laughs> and just straight from the openness from the heart. So, so it just feels such a connection within and that's coming out and it's very, very powerful. What would you take in your book to other than that? Like what like action thing you will take with you when you have to travel? Um, or to leave home? Mm -hmm. What is home for you? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, it's too hard. <laughs> but that was not my question. Don't look at me. That's the <laughs> I would I would take my family in my book chat. Mm. Because to me that's what home is. Mm. Yeah. That's so true. That's so true. When um when we um we went travelling in uh, Germany, we went in Berlin and my sister in law called me from Vienna saying that she have left Raqqa walking all the way to Turkey. And then she took buses and on and off walks until she got to Istanbul. She took the boat and she's now to Greece and she walked the walks and now she's waiting for us in Vienna to pick her up. And it was, we live here, you know, like this was just a magical thing. And I, I do believe in magical thing that made us be in the same 12 hours distance between us and her to go and drive all the way. And wasn't pregnant or anything. I was just like a new fresh bird with my husband. Um, but um, to get her. And they, talking about family, they have packed everything. And they got rid of every single thing as the journey got longer. Because they couldn't just carry the same thing. So, and they still, every time they hear the, the train going, they like have this moment of like fear. Because they think it's the bombs that were in Raqqa while they were there in ISIS. So, like, I think that's the wisest thing to do. All other things doesn't really matter as you have your family around you. Mm. So, yeah. But doesn't mean that you don't want to tell me what you would have in your book, Jay, Saeed and Louise. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask how, how strong the fabric is. Um, yeah, definitely family and probably... Um, There's a couple of letters that my brother wrote to me who passed away a very long time ago, who was an extraordinarily inspirational person. Um, I would take them in a notebook with a pencil. Well. Beck, do you want to tell us what you, Alicia, you unmuted yourself. Do you want to tell us what you would take in your book, Jay? No, I don't know about my book, Jay, but you made me want to say goodnight in Arabic and I haven't had anyone to say it to for a very long time. So I will say which I believe is, I like this because it's not good night. It's I hope you wake up to a nice morning. And that's what I wanted to say. Yes. Yeah. Well, I Thank you. I just wanted also to say, um, it was so inspirational. Uh, I think everyone touched on it. Um, Word can get very overwhelming at times. There's so many problems and so many things going on. But um, to me, takeaway tonight will be um, you don't need to solve all the problems in the world. It's just what you've got there, one project at a time. That's so important. You, you um, Otherwise, it's just you will be yeah paralyzed and, and not much can be done. And... Um, if you've got all the feelings in the world, but you can't make it into action, then it might might not yeah not have much of value. Um, but yeah, you, you've done an amazing job. But t by taking action, whatever the size, really doesn't matter. You've done amazing things. So um, yeah, that will be my takeaway. Hopefully, to what do you take in your book? Decide. Don't change the question. <laughs> in Bokja, it will be family. It will be yeah, amazing family we've got here. 
and what comes now in my mind it is memories as well that's mm -hmm. um living here it feels more and more far away the, the memories of childhood and mm -hmm. um yeah living with those so there you go thank you Sam. you are very lucky guys uh, Beck, do you want to end up the night? I, I didn't know the other people there. I, couldn't, I didn't see them all there, or the, any, any other than Nathan, but yeah. Would you like, what would you like to take in your book, Jay? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Yeah, nothing. Uh, I, a pencil and a piece of paper came to mind, you know, along with the people that I love, but there's too many people that I love. <laughs> A big one, big box chest. <laughs> <laughs> and a camel. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it just a pencil, maybe it just a pencil. But thank you. Thank you, thank you. So we didn't see you or hear you all night. Ah, uh, my name's Catherine. Um, and I joined quite late. I, um, but I have heard all of the discussion. So I joined at the moment that your presentation was ending and the discussion was beginning. But, um, but yeah, I think I would take tea leaves. They're very light, but the stopping and drinking tea is always a very lovely moment for me. And um, I could probably take quite a bit of tea without it being too heavy. So I could probably share some tea with some people that I met along the way. That's amazing. And a beautiful thought too. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, with that note of tea, to be able to wake up when my daughter decides to wake up, as you know. <laughs> but uh, it was one of really one of the most beautiful nights. And please, I can reach out on Facebook. My name is the same. And Instagram, in email. It's also the same with a dot in between and a Gmail. Um, I would love to be in touch with such beautiful families and definitely Rachel would love to make this cooking time and Yoki, you are naturally invite, inv invited to the place. So. <laughs> <laughs> so have a good night guys. And I'm so glad I, I made you, you, I made you laugh. You. I, I didn't mean it, but it just happens naturally. <laughs> yeah, it's Thank Thank you. You. Have a good night guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You came. I just saw that. I will add you soon. Yeah. See you. Bye. 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 Thank you.